You are a new creation in Christ is a foundational truth that speaks to the very heart of the Christian life. When we come to Christ, we do not merely turn over a new leaf, but we experience a profound transformation that goes far beyond external change. This transformation is a divine act, initiated by God Himself, where the old nature corrupted by sin and estranged from God is crucified with Christ. It is in His death that we, too, die to our former ways. Our hearts, once hardened and rebellious, are softened by His love and grace, and through the power of the Holy Spirit we are born anew. This new creation is not merely a patched-up version of the old. It is not like mending a garment with new fabric or trying to reform bad habits. No, it is far more profound. The Word tells us if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. This is not a superficial change, but a complete renewal of the entire person. The soul, once dead in sin, is now alive in Christ. The desires that once ruled us desires of the flesh, the world, and the devil are replaced by a longing for holiness, righteousness, and fellowship with God. This transformation begins in the heart, where the love of God is poured out through the Holy Spirit. The heart that was once in rebellion now beats with a new purpose to glorify God in all things. The mind, too, is renewed. Where once it was darkened by the deceit of sin, it is now enlightened by the truth of God's Word. The believer no longer thinks as the world thinks, but is transformed by the renewal of their mind, discerning the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The desires of the heart and mind are aligned with God's purposes, and the believer begins to seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The new creation is also evidenced in our conduct. The old self with its sinful habits and inclinations is put off, and the new self is put on, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is not something we can achieve in our own strength. It is the work of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us day by day, conforming us to the image of Christ. We do not become perfect overnight, but we are on a journey of transformation where each day we are being made more like our Savior. The fruit of the Spirit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control begins to manifest in our lives, testifying to the work of God within us. Moreover, being a new creation means that we have a new identity. We are no longer defined by our past sins, failures, or mistakes. We are not who we once were. The old labels that once described us sinner, lost, condemned, are replaced with new names, child of God, redeemed, justified. We belong to Christ, and nothing can separate us from His love. This new identity brings with it a new sense of purpose. We are no longer living for ourselves, but for the One who died and rose again for us. We are called to live as ambassadors for Christ, representing Him in the world, proclaiming His gospel, and showing forth His love in our actions. The power of this new creation is rooted in the resurrection of Christ. Just as He rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, so too are we raised to new life. This is not merely a future hope, though it certainly includes the promise of eternal life. It is a present reality. We have been raised with Christ, and we now walk in newness of life. This resurrection life empowers us to live differently, to resist the temptations of the world, to overcome the power of sin, and to walk in the freedom that Christ has secured for us. We are no longer slaves to sin, but are free to live as children of God. This new creation also brings with it a new family. We are not only made new individually, but are brought into a community of believers, the body of Christ. We are united with our brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing in the same Spirit, and together we grow in grace. This unity is a powerful testimony to the world of the transforming power of the gospel. The divisions that once separated us, be they social, racial, or economic, are broken down in Christ, and we are made one in Him. As members of this new family, we are called to love one another, bear each other's burdens, and encourage one another as we walk this path of faith. In addition, being a new creation means that we now live with a new hope. The old creation, marred by sin and subject to decay, is passing away. 
but we look forward to the new heavens and the new earth, where righteousness dwells. This hope gives us strength to endure the trials and tribulations of this life, knowing that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We are not defined by the circumstances of this world, for our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body. Furthermore, this new creation is not something that we boast in ourselves. It is entirely the work of God's grace. We did not earn it, nor do we deserve it. It is a gift given freely to all who place their faith in Christ. This humbles us, for we know that we were once lost and dead in our sins. But it also fills us with gratitude and joy, for we have been rescued, redeemed, and made new by the love of God. This gratitude overflows in worship as we offer our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Finally, the new creation reminds us of our calling. We are not saved merely to enjoy the benefits of salvation for ourselves. We are called to be witnesses to proclaim the good news of what Christ has done. Just as we have been made new, so too does God desire to make others new. We are His ambassadors entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation, urging others to be reconciled to God through Christ. Our new identity compels us to share this message of hope, knowing that in Christ all things are made new, and there is no one beyond the reach of His transforming grace. Adoption into God's family is a glorious truth, one that bestows upon us the highest privilege imaginable. To be adopted by the Creator of the universe is to be taken from the depths of spiritual poverty and placed into the arms of a loving Father, where we are no longer orphans wandering aimlessly, but cherished children with a name, a home, and an eternal inheritance. The Scriptures declare, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, which reveals the divine act of grace that transforms us from strangers into sons and daughters. This adoption is not based on our merit or worthiness, but solely upon the boundless love of God who chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. It was in love that He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. It is not something we could ever earn, for we were once enemies of God, dead in our trespasses and sins, alienated from Him by our own rebellion. Yet, in His mercy, He pursued us, drew us to Himself, and made us His own through the work of His Son on the cross. To be adopted into God's family means that we have a new identity. We are no longer identified by the labels the world or our past may have placed upon us. We are no longer bound by the chains of sin defined by our failures or marked by the shame of our former life. We are now called children of God, and this is not merely a title but a reality. As His children we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We are given the rights and privileges that belong to God's own Son, for we are in Him and He is in us. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed His children. This is not a cold, distant relationship, but an intimate one. The Spirit within us cries out, Abba, Father, a term of deep affection, signifying not only respect but closeness. We are not merely servants in the household of God, we are sons and daughters with access to the Father at all times. We approach Him not with fear but with confidence, knowing that He delights in us and desires to hear our prayers and commune with us daily. As adopted children, we also share in the love that the Father has for His Son. The love that the Father has for Jesus He now has for us because we are in Christ. This love is unchanging and unshakable. It is not dependent upon our performance, for we are not accepted because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. We are secure in this love, knowing that nothing in all creation can separate us from it. This gives us great comfort, for in a world where love is often conditional, the love of God remains constant. In God's family, we are also united with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The bond we share with fellow believers transcends any earthly ties, for it is a bond sealed by the Spirit of God. We are called to love one another as Christ has loved us, to bear one another's burdens, to forgive as we have been forgiven, and to serve one another in humility. This familial love is a reflection of the love of God Himself, 
and it is through this love that the world will know that we are his disciples. Our unity as the family of God is a powerful testimony to his grace. Moreover, being adopted into God's family means that we are under his fatherly care. The Father provides for us, protects us, and disciplines us as his children. His provision is not merely physical but spiritual, for he supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory. He watches over us with tenderness, guiding our steps and keeping us from harm. When we stray, he lovingly disciplines us, not as a harsh judge, but as a caring father who desires our growth in holiness. His correction is not punitive, but redemptive, meant to bring us back into fellowship with him. Adoption into God's family also brings with it a glorious inheritance. As heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, we are promised an eternal inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This inheritance is not merely material wealth, but the fullness of life in the presence of God, where we will enjoy eternal fellowship with Him, free from sin, sorrow, and death. We are already partakers of this inheritance, as the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee, a down payment of what is to come. We live with the hope and assurance that one day we will fully experience the riches of our inheritance in Christ. Our adoption also means that we have a new purpose, we are not only adopted to enjoy the privileges of sonship, but to fulfill the responsibilities that come with it. As children of God, we are called to be ambassadors of His kingdom, representing Him in the world. We are to live in a manner worthy of our calling, reflecting the character of our Father in all that we do. We are to be lights in the midst of darkness, showing the world the love, mercy, and truth of our Heavenly Father. Our adoption gives us a mission to proclaim the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Furthermore, our adoption assures us of our future. Just as a father prepares a place for his children, so too has our heavenly Father prepared a place for us. Jesus himself said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Our adoption guarantees that we will dwell with God forever. The trials and sufferings of this present life are but temporary, and they are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us when we are fully united with our Father in His eternal kingdom. This adoption also speaks to the heart of the gospel, for it is through Christ's sacrifice that we have been adopted. He, the eternal Son of God, took on flesh and became like us in every way, yet without sin. He lived the perfect life we could not live, and he died the death we deserve to die. Through his death and resurrection he reconciled us to God, making it possible for us to be brought into the family of God. Our adoption is a testament to the love and grace of God, who did not leave us in our sin but rescued us and made us his own. Finally, adoption into God's family fills us with joy and gratitude. We were once lost, but now we are found. We were once far off, but now we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were once orphans, but now we are children of the living God. This is the greatest privilege and the highest honor. It is a gift of grace, one that we could never earn, but one that we can rejoice in every day. As we live in the reality of our adoption, may our hearts be filled with thanksgiving, and may our lives reflect the glory of our Father who has called us His own. Sealed with the Holy Spirit is a profound truth that speaks of the assurance, security, and identity that, he, that every believer receives through the work of God. The moment a person comes to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within them, marking them as belonging to God. This divine seal is not something visible to human eyes, yet its effects are unmistakable in the life of the believer. The sealing of the Spirit is God's personal stamp upon His people, declaring that they are His set apart for His purposes, and secured for eternity. The seal of the Holy Spirit is a sign of ownership. In ancient times, kings and rulers would use a signet ring to seal official documents, confirming their authenticity and declaring that the contents were under their authority. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is God's signet upon us, confirming that we belong to Him. We are no longer our own, we have been bought with a price, and the Spirit's seal testifies that we are His treasured possession. 
This ownership is not oppressive or burdensome, but liberating, for to belong to God is to be under the care and protection of the one who loves us with an everlasting love. This sealing is also a mark of authenticity. Just as a royal seal guarantees the legitimacy of a document, the Holy Spirit within us is the guarantee of our faith. He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is not a mere feeling or emotional experience, but a deep, internal confirmation that we belong to the family of God. The presence of the Spirit is the evidence of genuine faith, for without Him no one can truly call Jesus Lord. It is the Spirit who opens our eyes to the truth of the Gospel, and it is the Spirit who continually affirms that we are indeed partakers of the divine nature. The seal of the Holy Spirit is also a sign of security. In the ancient world, a sealed document was protected from tampering or alteration until it reached its intended destination. In the same way, the Holy Spirit seals us, ensuring that we are kept safe until the day of redemption. This is a powerful assurance for the believer, for it means that our salvation is not something that can be lost or stolen. It is God Himself who preserves us, and He has given us His Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. The seal of the Spirit is the promise that we will be with God forever. Moreover, the seal of the Holy Spirit speaks of protection, just as a seal in ancient times could not be broken without the authority of the one who placed it, so too is the believer protected by the power of God. We are kept by the Spirit, guarded from the schemes of the enemy, and shielded by His presence. The Holy Spirit acts as our defender, the one who strengthens us in times of trial and temptation. When the enemy accuses and condemns, it is the Spirit who reminds us of our standing in Christ, assuring us that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. This sealing also signifies our sanctification. The Holy Spirit is not merely a passive seal. He is actively at work within us, transforming us from the inside out. He is the one who convicts us of sin, leads us into all truth, and empowers us to live a life that is pleasing to God. The seal of the Spirit is not just a mark of ownership, but also a mark of holiness. We have been set apart for God, and the Spirit is continually conforming us to the image of Christ. As we walk by the Spirit, we bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is evidence of His work in our lives. The seal of the Holy Spirit also represents a down payment or deposit of our future inheritance. Just as a deposit is given as a guarantee of full payment, the Holy Spirit is given to us as the guarantee that we will receive the full blessings of salvation in the age to come. We live in the already but not yet of God's kingdom. We have already been saved, yet we await the full realization of our salvation in the new heavens and the new earth. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of that future glory, a taste of what is to come assuring us that God will bring His work in us to completion. Furthermore, the seal of the Spirit is a mark of authority. Just as a king's seal carried the authority of his reign, so too does the seal of the Spirit grant us authority as ambassadors of Christ. We are sent into the world with the authority of the gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news and to live as witnesses of the kingdom. The Spirit equips us with gifts for service, enabling us to carry out the mission of God in the power of God. The seal of the Spirit not only confirms our identity, but also commissions us for the work of ministry. In addition, the Holy Spirit's sealing is a source of comfort. The Spirit is our comforter, the one who comes alongside us in times of trouble, reminding us of God's promises and assuring us of His presence. When we feel weak or discouraged, it is the Spirit who strengthens our hearts and lifts our eyes to Christ. He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, praying for us according to the will of God. The seal of the Spirit assures us that we are never alone, for He is with us always, guiding us, teaching us, and empowering us to persevere in faith. The seal of the Holy Spirit also signifies unity. All believers are sealed with the same Spirit, which means that we are united as one body in Christ. The dividing walls of hostility that once separated us have been torn down, and we are now one in the Spirit. This unity is a precious gift, for it is through the Spirit that we are able to love one another, 
serve one another, and live in harmony. The seal of the Spirit is a bond of peace, and we are called to maintain that unity by walking in humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. Moreover, being sealed with the Spirit is an ongoing experience. It is not merely a one-time event that occurs at the moment of salvation, but a continual work of the Spirit in our lives. We are called to be filled with the Spirit daily, to walk in step with the Spirit, and to keep in mind the things of the Spirit. The Spirit's work in us is progressive, leading us into deeper fellowship with God and greater conformity to Christ. As we yield to the Spirit, His seal becomes more evident in our lives as we grow in grace and reflect the character of our Savior. Finally, the seal of the Holy Spirit is a mark of belonging. We belong to God and nothing can change that reality. The world may try to define us by our achievements, our failures, or our circumstances, but the Spirit's seal declares that we are children of God, loved, chosen, and redeemed. This identity is unshakable, for it is rooted in the finished work of Christ and confirmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. As those who are sealed with the Spirit, we live with the assurance that we are secure in God's love and that He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. To be clothed in righteousness is to be covered not with our own deeds which are but filthy rags before God, but with the perfect righteousness of Christ. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, humanity has been in desperate need of a covering, for our sin has left us exposed before the holiness of God. When they first disobeyed, they sought to cover themselves with fig leaves, but this was insufficient. God, in His mercy, provided a covering for them through the sacrifice of an animal. This act pointed forward to the ultimate covering that would come through the sacrifice of His Son. Righteousness in its truest form is the perfect adherence to the law of God. Yet none of us can attain such righteousness on our own. The law was given to show us our sin, to reveal that we fall short of the glory of God. No amount of good works or religious efforts can bridge the gap that sin has created between us and God. Left to ourselves, we are spiritually naked, exposed in our guilt and shame. But God, in His great love, has provided a way for us to be clothed in the righteousness of another, namely the righteousness of Christ. Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, lived the life of perfect obedience that we could never live. From the cradle to the cross he fulfilled the law in every respect, loving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving his neighbor as himself. Not once did he sin, not once did he stray from the will of the Father. His righteousness is flawless, and it is this righteousness that he offers to all who come to him in faith. When we trust in Christ, a great exchange takes place, our sin is imputed to him, and his righteousness is imputed to us. This transaction is the heart of the gospel. On the cross, Christ bore the punishment for our sins, taking upon Himself the wrath of God that we deserved. In doing so, He removed our guilt, but He did more than that. He also credited to us His own righteousness, so that we might stand before God not merely as forgiven sinners, but as those who are perfectly righteous in His sight. This is what it means to be clothed in righteousness, to have the righteousness of Christ credited to our account, so that when God looks at us, He sees His Son. This righteousness is not something we can produce or earn. It is a gift freely given to all who believe. The Apostle Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Our righteousness is entirely from God, and it is received by faith alone. Faith is the empty hand that receives the gift of Christ's righteousness. It is not the strength of our faith that saves us, but the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. When we are clothed in Christ's righteousness, we are no longer under condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, writes Paul. This means that the accusations of the enemy, the guilt of our past, and the fear of judgment no longer have any power over us. We are declared righteous in the court of heaven, justified by the blood of Christ. This is a legal declaration, a once and for all pronouncement that we are righteous in God's sight, 
not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Being clothed in righteousness also means that we are accepted by God. No longer are we estranged from Him, no longer are we outsiders. Through Christ we have been brought near, adopted into His family, and made co-heirs with Him. The righteousness of Christ is our passport into the presence of God. It is the garment that allows us to enter into the throne room of grace with confidence, knowing that we are welcomed as sons and daughters of the King. This acceptance is not based on our performance but on Christ's finished work, which is why it is unchanging and unshakable. As those who are clothed in righteousness, we are called to live out this reality in our daily lives. While our standing before God is secure, we are also called to walk in righteousness, to reflect the character of Christ in our thoughts, words, and actions. This is the process of sanctification, where the Spirit of God works in us to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. We are to put off the old self which is corrupted by sinful desires and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This new life is not something we achieve in our own strength. Just as we are justified by faith, so too are we sanctified by faith, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk in righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control is the evidence of Christ's righteousness being worked out in us. As we abide in Christ, His righteousness bears fruit in our lives and we become living testimonies of His grace and power. Yet even as we strive to walk in righteousness, we must remember that our acceptance before God is not based on our ability to live perfectly. We will stumble and fall, for we are still in the flesh and the remnants of sin still cling to us. But when we fall, we must not despair, for our righteousness before God does not rest on our performance but on Christ's perfect obedience. In those moments we run to the cross, where we are reminded that we are clothed not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ, which is sufficient to cover all our sins. Moreover, to be clothed in righteousness is to live with the assurance of eternal life. Christ's righteousness not only secures our standing before God in this life, but also guarantees our future in His kingdom. We are heirs of eternal life, and the righteousness of Christ is our ticket to glory. On the day of judgment, when the books are opened and the deeds of all men are laid bare, those who are clothed in Christ's righteousness will stand unashamed. We will not be judged according to our sins, for they have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Instead, we will be welcomed into the joy of our Master. This hope of future glory strengthens us in the present, for we know that our righteousness in Christ is unshakable. Though the world may condemn us, though our own hearts may accuse us, we rest in the knowledge that we are righteous in God's sight because of Christ. This righteousness gives us confidence to face whatever trials may come, for we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It is the anchor of our souls, the foundation of our hope, and the source of our joy. Finally, being clothed in righteousness fills us with gratitude. How could it not? We were once clothed in the rags of our own sin, deserving only judgment, but now we are clothed in the royal robes of Christ's righteousness, destined for glory. This great exchange, the giving of our sin to Christ and the receiving of His righteousness, compels us to live lives of thankfulness and praise. We owe everything to Him, and our lives should reflect that reality as we seek to honor the One who has clothed us in His righteousness and as we eagerly await the day when we will be fully conformed to His image. Empowered by God's grace, the believer finds strength beyond their own capacity, for grace is the divine favor bestowed upon the unworthy, a gift that enables us to do what we could never accomplish on our own. In the beginning man fell into sin, and with that fall came weakness, an inability to fulfill the commands of God in our own power. Yet grace steps in where we fall short, providing not only forgiveness but also power. Grace does not leave us where it found us, it transforms and equips us for the good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. This grace is not a mere covering over of sin, though it does that marvelously. It is an active force, the very power of God working in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. We, 
who once were dead in trespasses and sins, are made alive together with Christ. It is by grace that we have been saved, and it is by grace that we are enabled to live in a manner worthy of our calling. We often think of grace as that which saves us, but it is also that which sustains and empowers us throughout our Christian journey. The Apostle Paul himself testified of this when he spoke of his own weakness, acknowledging that the thorn in his flesh kept him from boasting. Yet he heard from the Lord, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Grace, then, is the strength that undergirds the believer even in moments of frailty. It is not merely a passive attribute of God, but an active, empowering force that transforms our weaknesses into opportunities for God's strength to be displayed. When we are weak, we find that His grace is most fully manifested. This grace is not something we can earn. It is given freely by God to all who believe. The very nature of grace is that it is unmerited favor, a gift given to those who have not worked for it. Just as we cannot earn our salvation, so we cannot earn the grace that empowers us to live holy and obedient lives. Yet the more we rely on God and His grace, the more we find ourselves empowered to do things that we could never do in our own strength. It is in our dependence on Him that we are strengthened, for in Him we live and move and have our being. God's grace not only empowers us to overcome sin, but also enables us to endure trials and hardships. Throughout Scripture, we see saints who faced impossible odds yet overcame by the grace of God. Whether it was Noah building an ark when the world mocked him, or Moses standing before Pharaoh with nothing but a staff, each one was empowered by God's grace to accomplish what seemed impossible. In the same way, we too are empowered by that same grace to face the challenges that lie before us, knowing that it is not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. Grace does not only empower us for great feats of faith, but also for the daily tasks of Christian living. It is by grace that we are able to love our enemies, to forgive those who have wronged us, and to serve others selflessly. In our own strength we would fail in these areas repeatedly, for our flesh is weak and our hearts are prone to selfishness. But grace transforms us, enabling us to live as Christ lived, to love as He loved, and to serve as He served. This empowerment is not something we muster up within ourselves, but it flows from the grace of God that is at work within us. God's grace also empowers us to bear fruit in ministry. When we serve in the name of Christ, it is not by our own wisdom or strength that we bring forth fruit. Jesus told His disciples, Apart from Me you can do nothing. This truth is as relevant today as it was then. Every work of ministry, every act of service, every word of witness that bears eternal fruit is empowered by the grace of God. The same grace that saved us and sustains us also equips us for the work of the kingdom. It is a grace that flows abundantly, meeting every need as we step out in faith. Grace empowers us to persevere in the faith, even when the road is long and the trials are many. The Christian life is not a sprint but a marathon, and without the sustaining grace of God we would grow weary and faint. Yet His grace is sufficient to carry us through every valley, over every mountain, and along every rough path. It is this grace that enabled the saints of old to endure persecution, to face martyrdom, and to remain faithful even unto death. Their lives are a testimony to the empowering grace of God that strengthens His people for every challenge. Grace is the fuel that drives our sanctification, the process by which we are conformed more and more into the image of Christ. It is by grace that we are taught to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This transformation is not something we accomplish by sheer willpower or self-discipline. It is the work of God's grace within us. As we submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered by grace to put off the old self and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The grace of God not only empowers us for personal transformation, but also for our witness to the world. When the apostles were sent out to preach the gospel, they did not rely on their own eloquence or persuasive abilities. They were empowered by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The same is true for us today. When we share the gospel, when we live out our faith in a watching world, it is not our own strength or wisdom that makes the difference. It is the grace of God that works through us, enabling us to be effective witnesses for Christ.
I don't know how to write a love song It seems so hard to me I thought the problem was there's no conflict But I was wrong Hidden away, yeah, right there I'm scared of just how much it means to me I don't know how to put this into words How much I care To explain it How you make me feel this way When you put your hand through my hair When you hold me Saying it will be okay How could I possibly say you're right Oh I tried, I've been up all night I wish you knew How much I care How I'd be lost if you weren't there You ground me, you saved me You're another part of me I don't know how to explain it how you make me feel this way When you put your hand through my hair When you hold me saying It will be okay How could I possibly say it right? Oh, I tried, I've been up all night How much I knew How much I care How I'd be lost if you weren't there You ground me, you saved me You're another part of me How could a song be enough When everything we've been no matter how rough You rescue me, you stay true How I convey how you make my day I don't know how to say it all right way How much I care How I'd be lost if you weren't there You ground me, you save me You're another part of me I struggle to find hope I struggle to sleep at night I can't struggle to let you know let you go For so long you helped me fight We created life I don't know if this is a love song I don't know what to do Because I love you